my name is Tim Standish. I'm a senior scientist at the Geoscience Research Institute in Loma Linda, California. I trust the Bible because of the difference that it's made in my own life. In addition to that, when I compare what is written in the Bible, I find that it falls into one of two categories. One, it is verifiable to an amazing degree with other kinds of data that I have access to. There is a city, for example, named Jerusalem in Israel. There is a city named Nazareth, all these places, but also people, we find records of them as well in other sources. So that gives me more confidence in the Bible. In addition to that, there is wisdom in the Bible that transcends what we human beings are really capable of coming up with. Really profound ideas like love your neighbor as yourself. By trade, I'm a molecular biologist. And what I have learned from that is that God is a God of diversity and detail. When you start looking at how the molecular systems inside living things work, the detail, the forethought, the brilliant engineering that went into those systems is truly remarkable. At the same time, when you start comparing molecular systems from one organism to another, they also exhibit detailed differences that are profound and amazing. So God, he is very detail-oriented, but he also loves diversity and difference in his creation. Growing up, I went to secular schools as well as religiously oriented schools. In addition to that, um, when I did my PhD, it was at a secular university. I've also taught in secular colleges. And my basic principle when I'm relating to other people is to remain honest. If somebody wants to know about what I believe, I don't try to pretend I believe anything other than in the Bible and uh, that my faith is anything other than the Christian faith. Sometimes that has been uncomfortable, but in general, my experience has been that people appreciate that. They don't like me to be you know, preaching to them all the time, and I don't, but I do try to personally live a Christian life. I'm imperfect at it, but I try to be a witness in that respect. And when people have questions, I try to have an open and honest discussion about those questions. By keeping it open and honest, I think we will never have anything to be ashamed of. Yes, beneficial mutations definitely do exist, but the question really is, are there mutations that increase the amount of information that you find in an organism's genome? Generally speaking, what we call beneficial mutations actually destroy a function in a cell. But by doing that, they allow the cell to survive in a certain kind of environment. You can think of this as being something like building a racing car. Let's say you took your normal car that you drive down the road. The first thing you might do if you want to make a race car out of it is remove the, the seats, the extra seats. And then you'd remove things like maybe the windshield wipers because you are only going to race when it's not raining. And you might remove the lights because they, they're heavy and 
they might, you know, uh, they, they won't be used because you're not racing at night and you'd remove the air conditioning and all of these other things to make your car lighter. So those would be equivalent to beneficial mutations to make your car go faster, but they are not increasing the complexity. They are not increasing the amount of engineering that is actually in the vehicle. Those kinds of mutations, something like that, we actually see quite commonly, particularly when it comes to things like antibiotic resistance, for example, in bacteria. Sometimes you'll see the regulation of a gene damaged in such a way that a particular protein is overexpressed. And that actually helps the cell to survive in the presence of certain antibiotics. So that would be a specific kind of class of example that we see all the time. It really depends on how you define evolution. If you define evolution as change in organisms over time, that is a real phenomenon that we really can observe. Organisms seem to be made in such a way that they can rapidly adapt to changes in their environments. So in the case of Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands, what we see is small changes in the shape of the beaks that can happen within the space of a year. So that kind of evolution actually occurs very, very rapidly. But that is not the kind of evolution that Darwinism claims to have occurred. The claim is that organisms like dinosaurs turned into birds or that single-celled organisms turned into you and me. Those kinds of, that kind of evolution is something that is obviously not observable and appears to not be possible given the way life actually works. There's a kind of logic that says, because I don't know what something does, it must do nothing. And that is a very unsatisfying kind of logic. It's the kind of logic that has been used over the course of history when people have been talking about vestigial organs or junk DNA in the human genome. And the problem with that logic is that just because we don't understand what something does, does not mean that, in fact, it has no function. It actually means we might simply be ignorant. So, for example, when we look at some things that have been called vestigial organs in the past, just, just bits of um, you know, you know, things in our bodies that are left over by evolution, for, for example, our appendix, they have actually proven to be very important organs in our bodies. So, for example, with the appendix, not only does it play an important role in our immune system, it also plays a vital role in repopulating our gut with healthy bacteria after we've been ill. And you could go down through a whole list of what were thought to be vestigial organs and find similar things. That doesn't mean that we know what all of them do at this particular point but it does mean that the historical record doesn't give us confidence that we can really rely on these arguments from ignorance. All scientists start out with a basic set of fundamental beliefs that they're, that they're reasoning from. We call these paradigms and worldviews, things like that. And they can be both helpful and they can also hinder us as we seek to understand the, the natural world. Darwinism is just one example of a worldview 
that helps in some ways and hinders in other ways. Um, if you believe, for example, that Christianity hinders the development of scientific knowledge, how can you explain uh, the greatest scientists of all time? Uh, people like Isaac Newton, who revolutionized physics, or Robert Boyle, who revolutionized our understanding of chemistry, or Gregor Mendel, the founder of modern uh, um, genetics. Uh, these, these are all great men of science, and we could name many others who were coming at science from a Christian worldview. But we have to be careful. We can't pretend that just because somebody's a Darwinist, they can't do science. Science requires a commitment to certain basic things. We must believe, for example, that what we take in through our senses is actually a reliable representation of the physical world. There are other things like that. As long as somebody embraces those things, then they can be a productive scientist. A Darwinist is going to ask different questions than perhaps a believer in creation will. But that doesn't mean that they will be a better or a worse scientist necessarily. That really boils down to what comes out in the end. Sure, some Darwinian scientists have given us some important insights. However, I would argue that most of the time it was not their Darwinism that was actually the, the deciding thing in whatever it was they discovered. Epigenetics is an amazing new field that is just emerging right now. Essentially, what it has shown is that there are little chemical tags that can be put onto DNA that change the way in which genes are expressed. And these changes can be inherited from parents to offspring. This is a huge huge deal in biology because what it shows is that organisms can, in a heritable way, make changes to themselves and particularly to their offspring that better adapt them to the environment they live in. This is why organisms can adapt so rapidly, in many cases, to changes that they encounter. This whole system looks like it was planned ahead, anticipating that organisms would be challenged with different kinds of environments that they would have to adapt to. In addition to that, it raises big questions about the Darwinian mutation selection model when it comes to its ability to impact the sequence that we find in DNA because epigenetics actually insulates the genome from direct selective pressure, making mutation selection processes significantly more difficult and less likely to achieve the kinds of permanent changes that Darwinism predicts. The theory of evolution is a scientific theory, but Darwinism is a religious view. And it's important to differentiate between these two things. Like any scientific theory, evolution can be tested. But Darwinism is a worldview, a religious perspective that imposes interpretations on data. And as long as we can understand the difference between these two things, as Christians, like myself, we can 
appreciate them for what they are. Just being an evolutionist actually does not make you not a Christian. Being an evolutionist does not make you a Darwinist either. I personally believe that the evidence, both from Scripture and from nature itself, suggests that while organisms can adapt rapidly to changes in their environment, which means they evolve in a very rapid but small way, I believe that that is something that points towards the God of the Bible who anticipates the kinds of challenges that organisms would have. Does that make me an evolutionary biologist? No, it does not. Does that mean that I believe that bacteria can evolve into pine trees? No, it does not. And it certainly doesn't mean that I believe that is what actually did happen. So we need to keep these terms very clear in our minds. Um, certainly, a person who is not a Darwinist can be a very good scientist because we see people who are not Darwinists being very good scientists all the time. In fact, some of the greatest scientists living today, like James Tor, the um, very famous chemist, he is a Bible-believing Christian. So obviously, you don't have to be a Darwinist to be a good scientist.